This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The rebirth of Overton Square tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News, joined tonight by a number of folks involved with the rebirth and the ongoing growth of Overton Square. We've got Jackie Nichols from Playhouse on the Square and other entities. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. June West from Memphis Heritage. Thank you for being here. Thanks for asking. Ekandayo Bandelay from Hadalu Theater. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And Bob Loeb, Loeb Properties. Thanks also. Thanks, Eric. Also Bill Drees from the Memphis Daily News. So I'm, I'm going to start, I think I'm going to go to the, my right here and start with you, but kind of a question for everyone. You know, what does it take, uh, Overton Square sat dormant for quite some time. Um, you know, June West fought, you know, and others fought a fight to, to not have the old buildings raised. And it just, there were, there were many years there where it seemed like nothing was going to happen. What does it take, and, and other folks were still there, you know, like Jackie Nichols, but what does it take from you as a, from a business point of view to redevelop in the urban core? You know, so many developers just go out east, the land is cheap, it's big, it's vacant, you can put stuff up. You chose to develop inside the urban core and not an easy property to redevelop. Why and how? We've been following Overton Square for 20 years, have owned a property over there for 25 years, and, um, and we've been active in Midtown uh, investment and development for 25 years. So we've had our eyes on the square and we thought that there was uh, demand there all along. The prior developers had a vision that was uh, just not appropriate for the property, so they were never able to implement their plan, but there was always opportunity there. And, and Jackie, you've been there for a long time in various forms, You, you through the good years and bad years. Right, since, uh, since 1975. 75. Yeah. Um, what does it mean to you to be in Overton Square? What, how important is it to Playhouse on the Square? I mean, that location. Well, it's in our title. So uh, it wouldn't be good if we were a playhouse on the square down on the river. Um, uh, we were actually brought into the square to, uh, for many of the same reasons it's, it's valid today, is that our patrons are the kinds of folks that are going to go to the restaurants and the shops and enjoy that. So Overton Square uh, brought us in in 1975 after Lafayette's music hall failed because it was losing so much money. Uh, and when they saw the other kinds of shows we were doing at our other locations, said, we want a theater in Overton Square. And so that's, that was our beginning. But you invested, you built the new <clears throat> theater across the street from the old one when things before Mr. Loeb here had, you know, moved forward. I mean, you, it was, those were sort of dark days. I mean, yeah. it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of activity. There were some great restaurants and so on, but there was a lot of vacant space there, but you kind of doubled down on that location. Yeah, we knew, we knew that it had the ability to come back. And uh, an example of that, you know, our board made the decision to go forward raising the uh, $12.5 million to, to build the theater after a lot of discussion with our board, even lost a couple of board members over that. <laughs> But uh, I guess the best example of people believing in what, what, what we saw as the vision that it, it could come back and it could come back as a theater and entertainment district was uh, we were doing our $12.5 million capital drive and one of the foundations, the only major foundation from outside of Memphis, the Kresge Foundation, uh, has $3 billion in assets. They give out $150 million a year. We applied for them for a grant. Uh, you can only apply after you've raised three-fourths of your money, and you can only apply for 20% of what's left over. For us, that was $500,000. Uh, so we, we were awarded a grant from them, uh, and the check arrived, and the check was for $650,000. And so we immediately called them before we cashed it, <laughs> and we, and we asked them and said, well, this is more money than we could even ask for. And they said that their board of directors had met and felt that this one was not just a new theater for Playhouse, but had the ability to be a major redevelopment for the neighborhood. So here's on the outside, a major, one of the largest foundations in the country, looking at all that and saying, this is going to make a difference. Right. And Eck, you're uh, a, about to be a new tenant, yeah. your theater. Um, why, you've been down kind of halfway the Edge District, halfway mm -hmm. between downtown and, and Midtown. Right. Why Overton Square? Well, I mean, it's kind of what... 
uh, Bob always says in his speeches and kind of what Jackie says, and, and that is uh, Bob Lowe called, you know, Henry Turley and said, what should Overton Square be? And Henry Turley said, a theater district. And <laughs> Jackie, of course, said, you know, what you need for a theater district is more theaters. And there we are in the Edge District on Marshall Avenue. And our audience uh, was growing, growing, and growing. And we had actually um, outgrown the storefront where we are presently. And we were looking. We were actively looking for somewhere. And uh, somebody in Mayor Wharton's office came to me, Carrie Hayes, and said, if, you, uh, if, if, if Loeb wanted to talk to you about building an Overton Square, would you entertain the idea? And of course, uh, Jackie's been my mentor from the beginning, even before I had Elu open. Um, he's kind of led me through the development of the organization. And with those three stage theaters already there, and then the movie theater studio on the square right across the street, it, the symbiotic relationship just made sense. And us moving anywhere else did not make sense. Right. And I want to come back to that, but let me get June in and come back to some of those choices and the choices that people make about where they locate in the city. But June, this must make you all, all this must make you very happy. You you have fought a lot of fights over historic properties and historic areas in Memphis. Right. You've taken a lot of heat sometimes. And oh, we sure. can talk about some of the other ones that are ongoing, you know, battles won, battles lost. And, undefeated. Yeah, uh, undefeated. Well, no, undefeated. Yeah, and defe yeah, well, yeah. we've had our defeats, but we keep on you know, trucking like the bunny. But uh, basically what we knew is those buildings could be revived, not not just, you know, f for their history and all of what, it gives a sense of place to Midtown. And we knew we didn't want a box grocery store with a large parking lot. I mean, that's pretty much sums it up. And in negotiating with the group that came into town wanting to do that, um, we felt they were not being extremely transparent on what they wanted to do. and. Sometimes you just take the bull by the horns and, you know, we first started talking to uh, James Raspberry who had it listed uh, through the, with the owners, Blake Fisher in, in Colorado, and they told me the buildings are so dangerous I can't let you walk in them, uh, they're obsolete, they've outlived their time, and that's, those phrases just eat me up when I see them in the paper. They're used so often, and I'm not saying every building should be saved, nor can it be saved, but you know, you you can if if you have a mindset and a vision, you can do it. And right. I'm very grateful to Bob because we stayed on the phone a lot <laughs> during that period of time, because I knew there was a, a possibility when when you know the gentleman from uh, Blake Fisher's office said, you know, well, what do you want us to do? And I said, well, it needs you know it needs to be developed by somebody local who understands our city, because that's a problem here when we have outsiders come in. I'm not saying they're not welcome, but they don't do their. I was a developer before I took over Memphis Heritage, and you do your due diligence. You market, you talk to people, and a lot of out-of-towners don't do that. And so uh, it, it didn't make sense what they were marketing it as. And so with that, uh, you know, Blake said, what do you want me to do? And I said, talk to Bob Loeb. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and basically uh, we knew that Bob had the vision, that Jackie had the vision, all the folks in the Midtown had the vision, and uh, we knew it was something worth fighting for. Bill. Um, Bob, Jackie talked here a little bit about Lafayette, a, a business that in the grand scheme of things in Overton Square didn't last that long and didn't do that well certainly toward the end, but it still endures sentimentally with people. And your business is, is to look at things perhaps sentimentally, but certainly not totally sentimentally. So where does the vision for Overton Square um, depart from kind of the myth of Overton Square? Um, We've wanted to connect with the history. Some people said we needed to chase Fridays and get a new uh, Fridays in mm -hmm. there. And, and there are parts of the past that w uh, this past weekend I had people telling me we needed to open a place called Bombay Bicycle Club. Mm -hmm. Great names, great memories, but we want a 2000 teens version of the community that existed when Overton Square thrived. And so it'll be a combination of connection with the past and moving forward to the future. Um, I said a lot that uh, these guys in the theater business will relate to this. You can build a nice building, but what keeps people coming back is the programming. And um, we're certainly putting our effort into facilities and making them look, lot, look nice. But the important thing is to have programming that keeps bringing people back mm -hmm. and we think that music is a part of that and so we've got several venues that we can 
play music out of. We're about to make our most exciting announcement yet on uh, space real close to where you were just talking about. So You can um, go ahead and do that right now. That is a news I'm not authorized. They only give me a little bit of rope. All right. Uh, Ekendio and Jackie, talk to me about the synergy of having this many theaters in one very compact area. Does it? Does this kind of take on a life of its own? I mean, obviously your theater groups have been here and have been working, but now that you're in this district, quote unquote, what 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 happens with being that close together? Well, I mean, it's great. I mean, people can uh, uh, decide they're going to come to Overton Square without even knowing what show they're going to go to, go to a restaurant. If they get there, something sold out, they can see something else. But it's not just a theater district. Uh, Ballet Memphis performs with us six times a year. Uh, Indy Memphis just finished an enormously successful film festival and is continuing to expand that in the future. It could be another Sundance in the future for Memphis. So it's, it, it's, it's the arts in general. It, it's all of those things. We bring 60,000 people a year to Playhouse and Circuit. Uh, theater Works has another 10,000. Indy Memphis, Ballet Memphis. I mean, Ekandaya's numbers. I mean, it's going to be 150, 200,000 people coming to the arts in there, and all all you've got to do as a restaurant is just screw up. I mean, because we're, <laughs> you know, we're can you say that on the yeah, 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 sure. uh, yeah. yeah, you know, as long as you don't name any restaurants, <laughs> that's how we get in trouble. You know, they're all doing great so far, but you know, you just you know, we're going to have the people in the square, and 85 percent of our patrons eat or drink before or after they come to the show. That's on continued surveys that we do. So we're bringing the audience to the square. All the restaurants have to do is open their doors and provide good food. You know, my thing on the close proximity of these theaters is this. Um, you have somebody come see a show, say on opening night, and there's usually around six weeks in between one opening night and the next opening night of the next show. That's enough span of time for somebody to return home and get hooked on Scandal or Blacklist or some other TV show or get hooked on some Scrabble uh, group or something like that. And before you know it, they've dropped off from the arts. And so you can have a person come, come to Overton Square and they can be engaged in the arts for almost a month, every weekend. And, and another thing that we need to look at is that restaurants, those are the culinary arts. And so it's not just on stage. You have, like I say, you have the studio on the square right over there. And so this is a way to keep people out and keep them engaged in culture and, and keep them engaged in community building and seeing one another. And, and there are so many things that can happen when people see one another on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so they can come to Playhouse one weekend or go to Circuit, go to Theater Works, come to Hattie Lou. And before you know it, Playhouse has another show opening. So now they're back at Playhouse, and now they're back here. And they're always in the square. And there's always something new and something vibrant going on. And so that's what I am excited about, about this close proximity. And with me being a New Yorker, I just love walking. That you don't have to get in, you park in that new beautiful garage, and you get out. And you don't have to go back until you go home, and you don't have to go home. Hopefully you'll go to a hotel or somewhere, hopefully, we'll see. Um, but these are some of the things that are so exciting about this development. So the new garage, are we covering all the bases for you, Bob? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the garage, the garage, right. the garage. <laughs> well, great, and, great urban art as well, I might add. Yeah, well, and, and, yeah Bobo's piece is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And 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 Ekendale mentioned the hotel. How how important to what you're doing is uh, a hotel, or or how important is a hotel to where the French Quarter Inn is now? We Jackie and I were talking about that before the program, and and he was talking about just Indy this past weekend. It's growing to the point that they need to have uh, lodging facilities nearby, and so we. Uh, uh, we um, think that it would be a great uh, amenity for Midtown from the roads to CBU, the theaters, the uh, Jackie's got uh, up to the, um, the screen actors uh, screening that he has, a mm -hmm. bunch of people in town, can't even host all of them there, but um, 
that property will be redeveloped, whether it's redeveloped as a hotel or other use is yet to be seen, but we're making steady progress. Uh, we've got a, a, some good tenants that have uh, signed leases and are improving space but aren't online yet. We've got others in the pipeline and this momentum will continue to build and so it's just going to help the whole neighborhood. One of our measures of success is we don't want to be the only ones uh, that are developing property over there. We'd love to see others come so I was hopeful that this past group would be successful but the fact that they didn't figure it out it, it, uh, does, doesn't mean that uh, that property won't be redeveloped. So uh, in my mind, it's just a matter of time and uh, I'm hoping sooner than later. We talk, Jim, um, we talk about all this excitement and this development and, and you know, the enthusiasm of people and then you know, the investment of money. You talked before about some of the fights and some of the losses. One loss in that neighborhood from your perspective and from a lot of people's perspective was the church right. uh, at Union and um, uh, Cooper, which right. is now a drugstore. Um, you know, do you look back at a fight like that and think, what could we have done differently? Or maybe if the timing had been different, you know, that if all this momentum were going on, could there another buyer have maybe come for that church? Or is that just a lost cause and you don't look back? You try not to look back because, you know, you drive to that corner and go, there was such a monumental landmark there that would have been, it had great acoustics. Uh, Cal Asperian sang it and said it had the best acoustics second to the Cannon Center. So it had, options, it had possibilities. Right. I think one of the things preservationists need to work on is pre-work, is getting to a point where we're raising a fund where we could have perhaps offered money to that church to help fix its roof early on, where even a small congregation could even be there. Um, so it's preventative work that needs to be done that we need to uh, put our effort there, <laughs> and that's what we're trying to do over the next several years. But I, I think that um, I, one of the nicest things Bob ever said to me is, as you're going down Union, going west, look to the east. I'm sorry, look to the north, <laughs> not to the south. So I did. I tried not to look that direction. At, at the site, yeah. yeah. And right well, now, one thing about okay, it is, go ahead. It, it, once that, uh, that drugstore closes, we plan to acquire that property and build a <laughs> concert hall there that looks not unlike the Union Avenue Methodist Church. Well, the, the, the Union okay. Avenue Methodist... I guess Methodist. the fight is not done, is, yeah. is your no, point no, there? No, no, thank you, Jackie. I appreciate that boost. He, he even offered to let me have napkins made <laughs> that said never again, you know, yeah. with the picture of the church right, for his right. group. But one, one quick thing, the... Uh, you you have to look forward, you have to continue, but it, that building, if you went inside, looks so much like the Grand Ole Opry. Mm -hmm. It was so much like the Ryman, and Ryman started as a church, and so that was part of the bittersweetness of it, that yeah. we knew that there could be some possibility and, there. And what about right now, just, it's outside, uh, um over in Square, but the 19th Century Club, it's news right now, you're in the middle of, uh, your group and others in the middle of a lawsuit to s try to right. stop its demolition. Right. Uh, I mean, again, talking about a fund and learning from past mistakes, is that, you feel pretty good about where you are? Or? We, we feel very good where we are. We, we didn't want it to go to this extent, but when you have to do everything you can, you go into an appeal and that's where we are. There are other buyers coming forward now that we have given it time for people to realize the importance of that building. And there's some very valid potential new purchasers that if the present owners are willing to sell, they will restore it and save it. Um, but one thing I want to say about the extent of Bob saying wanting other people to come around, I mean, if you go down Cooper, everything's going to make a big, long square. You go down Madison, the redevelopment and people taking pride in their buildings now and even putting artwork on the sides of their buildings where they never would have thought of doing that if Bob hadn't started this process, I think. And I talked to a, an older lady yesterday and she said, Midtown's hot. <laughs> and I mean, I love it when that, you know, but she said, you know, and, and I'm, I live in Midtown. I'm very proud. Our offices right. are right down the street on Madison. Yeah. So we are part of the neighborhood. Right. Bill. It, it seems as if it's, it's really hard to talk about this over, over a stretch of decades because so much is going on. It took so much work to get here. But at, at some point, does this momentum jump Union Avenue and go south, or does what is happening in these different spots just work organically? And it's I think you've got uh, different areas. Carrie Hayes, 
um, that Eck mentioned uh, early on told me that each of these districts in Midtown need to have their own distinct characteristics. So you've got Cooper Young, you've got Overton Square, Broad Historic, uh, Sears Crosstown, and they're each each have their own distinct characteristics, and they're and they're others, and they each of them are growing uh, in their own ways, and hopefully they just keep growing outward and eventually connect. So, uh, and are you confident that you know people cynics or critics or I don't know cautious folks, you know, will say, well, yeah, but you're just you're still just attracting the same people, and so you're shifting them from Cooper Young up to the great restaurants, the new restaurants or old restaurants up in Overton Square. I mean, are you from a business point of view? I mean, confident that you are growing, not just shifting. The dollars shifting long, the people. Long term, we you know what I've been saying is Midtown's a couple hundred thousand people short, and we need to make it an attractive uh, place. So each of those centers that I mentioned are uh, I call them fly traps to attract okay. new residents into Midtown. And in this new urbanist movement, we're saying that the next generation is is uh, going to live in an urban uh, setting. Seventy five percent of them are. Uh, Memphis inside, in and around the parkways is a great urban setting. We've got a bunch of authentic cultural assets that are each growing. Now the history of the development business is that developers can, out, can provide new supply faster than demand can grow. Memphis doesn't have a whole lot of new people moving here. Uh, we've, uh, and so it's going to take time. In short term, we can build more supply of, right. of places than there is uh, purchasing right. power demand. But the hope is that over time that demand will grow. It, and it that's the plan that we're betting on that. Yeah, it, it is interesting. And I may be editorializing for a second, but you know, you've got Kroger putting, what is it, 20, 30 million dollars yeah, into it, that. I mean, that, it, that's real money into an area that some people would say, well, this is all dead and it's, you know, everyone's moving east. And you've got, you know, talk. I don't know that you can confirm this, but talk that Fresh Market is going to take over at that corner of Union and, and Cooper. I mean, that's a big investment and, and draws people in. So that must be edifying and to you, it, just from a business point of view, that you're not the only person putting money the into retailer, this. Retailers, there are a lot of them that want right. in Midtown and aggregating a big enough site for some of them that want to be there it yeah. is a challenge. Uh, but I think Midtown, it, the momentum's picking up. And mm -hmm. who's the elderly lady that said Midtown is hot. Oh, well, I won't give her name. But, uh, but she's right. I she's, think that we're going to see momentum build. I want to go back to something you said early on about, you know, you were looking uh, around, you'd outgrown your space. I mean, there is a, 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 a desire sometimes or maybe a need or um, a perception among nonprofits, arts, what, what people, you know, you, you make a certain amount of money off tickets, but a certain amount off, I assume, you know, donations and, right. and, and wealthier um, individuals. And for a lot of people, that means, well, you got to move to where the money is. Mm -hmm. you got to move out east. Mm -hmm. And I imagine, Jackie, over the year, I mean, I'm sure you've had board members who said, look, hey, you know, the people who go to There's the theater. There's a lot of money in Midtown, too. But, mm -hmm. yeah, so is that is that what you weigh? I mean, as Not in terms of location? But no. one of the things that Marshall, our present location, taught us is that um, if people want what we offer bad enough, they'll drive yeah. to it. All right, Marshall, outside of Sun Studio, is pretty much off the beaten path. And it's not the best of locations. And some people, you know, we have a lot of elderly patrons. Some people don't feel necessarily safe parking and walking up that steep hill yeah. to get to Hattie Lou, however they do it. Yeah. And so by moving to Overton Square, where the amenities are much better, there's ample parking, there are restaurants, there's security, this just makes it even better. But to that point, we had an anonymous donor who said if we, Hattie Lou, could raise $500,000 from the black community, that we would receive 500000 And so you saying, you know, move where the money is. One thing is, is the African-American community had not really been that involved in the philanthropic community in this city. Pretty much there weren't a lot of offerings that mirrored their cultural uh, nuance. And so here we are, Hattie Lou. We've actually raised over $700,000 from the African-American community. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to move to Twinkletown, which is in Whitehaven, or move to um, South Parkway East, or where the black affluent live. They see this um, cultural gem um, that reflects their contributions to the city, and they want to see it as part of the macrocosmic 
um, community that is Memphis and that is right, right. now microcosmic is in Overton Square. And I think, just a couple of minutes left, I think you talk about race and you talk about um, African American community. I think you've spoken before about how part of what you you know, this was this great location for you to move into, but mm -hmm. you also brought an audience and, yeah. and brought a, a level of diversity and of people with dollars in their pockets who are going to spend money at these restaurants. And that, exactly. that was part of your calculation with Mr. Loeb, I think. That was a big thing. I mean, right now, a lot of the fluent blacks, the black gentry, they go to Atlanta and Chicago and New York, and they take those dollars outside of our city. Um, but right now, with Hattie Lou, the offerings say, stay here spend your dollars here, invest in your city and in your community. And so we are bringing our audience to Overton Square, some of which there is, of course, um, some overlap with Hattie Lou and Playhouse okay. and his other theaters. Okay, just, just a minute left. I'm gonna put you on the spot for a second. We talked about districts. There's a proposal been up and down about the fairgrounds. The, the, uh, I won't get into the details of the tax side of it, but redeveloping the fairgrounds, um, I think everyone was real happy with the with Croc and with the the, uh, the Tiger Lane, but there's talk of another district, another retail district. We've got Cooper Young businesses who are a little worried about that. What's your take on that? Is would you like to see development on a retail basis on the fairgrounds? I think there's uh, opportunity. As I mentioned, all the districts are different, and there's some retailers who would like to be in Midtown who can't get large enough site and. Uh, the fairgrounds does offer a site uh, that would be large enough to attract retailers that Midtown okay. would like that would not be competitive with Cooper Young or Overton okay. Square. It would be distinct, okay. different. All and right. so okay. I think that helps. Okay. i cut you off at the okay. end here. Thank you for being here. Bob Loeb, June West, Jackie Nichols, Eck, thank you. Bill Drees, thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Good night.